Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly 90 minute deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Lisa. I'm a clinical psychologist and a college counselor. I am a parent of a boy in elementary school, a girl in middle school, and a girl in college. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, a new rush to create a three-year degree option by Emmett Whitford at the Wall Street Journal. That's part two of two. Mark will be discussing what changes do you foresee in college admissions over the next few years. That'll be part four of four. Our interview is with Michael Ireland, the Assistant Director of Financial Aid at Smith College, and Courtney Hatch Blavelt, a former financial aid officer at four colleges and Director of College Counseling at the Miss Hall School, answering 12 questions our listeners sent in about financial aid and paying for college. That's part four of five. And our college spotlight is part two of two from Kevin Newton on the University College London. Okay, friends, and let me just say, everybody, Happy New Year, first of all. Uh, happy New Year to you. Yeah, Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. Dave, are you, an, are you a New Year's resolution guy? Well, yeah, less COVID, less inflation. <laughs> <laughs> you go macro on me, man. I'm talking about personal stuff like exercise and losing weight and eating better and reading more and praying and all that stuff <laughs> oh all the above but I, I don't i don't believe in putting unnecessary pressure on myself for just one new year <laughs> that's probably safe <laughs> because how many of those how many of those resolutions even make it to the end of january <laughs> that's right that's right I, I remember a famous new year's resolution that some celebrity said like i told myself uh Last year I was proud, but this year I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Figured it would be a celebrity that would do That's that. Right. <laughs> All right. So, friends, uh, for our, our admissions tip, this has to do with when you're answering the why us, very, very common question, why this school, why us, that you so many schools ask. And I, I really, there's so many things I could say. I literally could say 20 things about this, but this is just one little thing. If you've been on the campus, integrate that into your answer. You know, so it can be a one-liner. Like when I was on campus and I was talking with the tour guide and she said, and he said, and believe it or not, even saying the talking about the feel that you got when you were on campus, that stuff actually matters because admission officers are not just concerned with, are you a good student and are you a good citizen and will you contribute? But they're trying to make a match. And so when you talk about how it felt right, and it, it is better if you can give a reason, but it's a nice reminder to them that, you know what, I could really see this person here. It's not just about admitting people who meet your admission standard. It's about meeting people who understand what they're getting into and are looking for what you have to offer. And so a great way to reinforce that is when I was on my visit and, you know, fill in the blank, whether the conversation that I had or it can even be things like just the architecture and the layout of the campus is it really resonated with me. And don't feel like it has to be all objective stats, details, like some of that personal stuff adds a really nice touch to your why us or your why this school essay. Does that make sense, Dave? Yeah, it makes very much sense. I know it sounds like warm, fuzzy, mushy stuff. But it, but it, it, but it resonates if, if done tactfully. Now it shouldn't dominate your essay. You know, a nice little one sentence, depending how long it is. If it's, it's, a, if it's 150 word or one sentence, if you got 300 words, four or 500, then maybe you can make it two sentences. So, um, I wouldn't dominate your essay with that, but it, it can add a nice little touch to that essay. Yes. Okay. And our big number, our big number is 3.1 million. What is that? 3.1 million common apps have been completed through. November 16th. That is up to, from 2.6 million last year. So it's pretty rock solid evidence that more people are applying to more colleges. And 
Um, you know, Dave and I are going back and forth debating whether to do it in the news on a particular article that came out. The evidence is that it's coming from more affluent families who are upping their applications, in some cases, into the 20s. Um, and I talk about this a little bit with with Lisa as well in terms of the trends. One of the trends is is apply to more schools. Don't feel like you need to visit all of them on the front end. See where you get in and then go visit. And here's the proof. Up from 2.6 million applications last year to 3.1 million this year. 3.1 million is our big number. Friends, as I was editing episode 205, I realized I forgot something we do every fifth episode. Stucks rants and Stucks raves. So you're not going to hear Dave's reaction here. I'm flying solo, but I don't want to deprive you of this. And we name names here. So I'm starting out with Stucks rants and Stucks rave. And yes, I am calling you out, Georgia. Sorry, Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech. And it's your college specific questions. So Virginia Tech frustrated me this year as I worked with several students applying there because what they do in their college specific questions is they jam so many questions in and such and they give you so few words to do it. So consider this question. Share a time when you were most proud of yourself, either as a role model or when you displayed leadership. OK, that's question one. Most proud of yourself, role model, or displayed leadership. Question two, what specific skills did you contribute to the experience? Question three, how did others rely on you for guidance? And question four, what did you learn about yourself during this time? Perfectly legitimate questions. But 120 words to answer for question? Come on, Virginia Tech. Either expand this to a three to 500 word essay and hire more staff to read it. Stop trying to make it so easy on your readers by only making it 120 words, but then asking a student to answer four questions and 120 words. And if it doesn't get worse than that, it actually does because they follow it up with another one. Next question. Describe a goal that you have set and the steps you will take to achieve it. So that's two questions right there. You got to describe your goal. Then you have to describe the steps you're going to take to achieve it. Question three, what made you set this goal for yourself? Question four, what is your timeline to achieve this goal? Question five, who do you seek encouragement or guidance from as you work on this goal? And yes, 120 words. These were the hardest college-specific questions I had to work on all year because you're asking five questions in 120 words. I do give you credit for having college-specific questions and customizing your application, but come on, you got to work with me. You can't expect a student to answer five questions in 120 words. All right, now, Stucks Rave. So, boy, this is a tough one because there are a lot of different people involved in this. Who do I rave? Who do I shout out? I'm going back to a trend, I, I, I very, very, very early in trend in its nascent form I've identified, but I see taking off like a wildfire, and that is schools no longer only being able to just give net price calculators, but having to actually look at tax returns and give you something more reliable. So who do I shout out? Well, I could sh shout out Franklin and Marshall because they're the first school I know to ever do this, and they've been doing this literally for more than 15 years. But they only really have done it for early decision applicants. So they deserve partial credit. Do I shout out Ron Lieber, who we recently uh, acknowledged his fantastic book, The Price You Pay for College, and a recommended resources? He has literally been going around to every VP of enrollment who will listen and saying, you've got to be transparent in your aid awards. You've got to start actually letting people know what they actually pay and not just giving an net price calculator. He deserves some credit. Do we shout out College of Worcester that went beyond Franklin and Marshall? And they actually, on their financial aid website, you can check it out. They say net price calculators are often algorithmic and only an estimate. So while they're good, they're not great. You don't see that very often. They provide their detailed estimate, not just for early decision applicants, but for even people that that may not apply, but want to find out in advance. 
and they start doing it very early in the year. And once again, you do not even need to apply. So they deserve a lot of credit. But I'm going to shout out Whitman College. Now, they're one of the more recent ones, part of the reason why I think this is taking off. They go beyond something even Wooster does. The language is important. Check out Whitman College. You can go on their website. Here's a term they use to describe it. Early financial aid, check this word, guarantee. That is not insignificant. They're not using the word estimator. They're using the word guarantee. I'm going to read what they say. When it comes to choosing a college, we know that cost plays a big role. At Whitman College, we're committed to making financial aid process easier and less confusing. We'll be as transparent as possible. That's why we're offering, now check this out. They put this in bold. This is the only part in bold. Whitman's early financial aid, yes, guarantee. What does it go on to say? You don't have to wait until you are admitted to start thinking about cost. In fact, you can find out before you even apply with our early, repeated guarantee. You see how much money in scholarships and financial aid you will be awarded from Whitman if admitted. And it goes and breaks down. You'll get your merit-based award. You'll get your need-based award. So shout out to Whitman for taking it to the next level and including the word guarantee. And once again, this is a full-blown um, evaluation of your tax return, something you can count on. And and I've said before, you know, colleges are scared to do this, partly because they want the wiggle room and partly because it would require a lot of manpower to actually review all the tax returns. But I've, co I've contended that the publicity you'll get is worth it. And there's a link to the New York Times shouting out Whitman uh, for doing this. So shout out to Whitman, well-deserved. And I want all you out there to challenge the schools as you visit them to say, are you going to do what Whitman and Wooster and f and and some of these other schools, Trinity, Hobart, William Smith, are doing now and giving a guarantee and actually looking at tax returns going beyond the net price calculator. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. Okay, friends, we'll now resume with part two from an article that Dave and I started last week, a new push to create a three-year degree option by Emma Whitford of Inside Higher Ed. And I encourage creativity. I like to see some disruption and alternatives. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all. I'm not saying it's one-size-fits-all now, but I still think education could use some more creativity in, term, you know, in terms of alternatives. And, and, and there, yeah, there's certainly a lot out there, but I feel there could be more. And, and I think, I really think the key for something like this really taking off would be for them to make sure that they align this up with certain majors um, and with it's the internships and the, and the experiential education so that people are coming out and getting jobs and getting good jobs. And if, if the programs develop the reputation of, wow, you go through this program and you come out. Uh, with not only a job, but a good job, because that's what Merrimack College is talking about doing. I mean, President Christopher Hopi says we're, he likes the idea of targeting what he calls new economy jobs, like business, finance, engineering, and nursing. And the program would have more professional, more intern experience than a typical undergraduate program. You know, if you're offering more of something rather than just less, rather than just three quarters of my McDonald's fries or three quarters of my burger, and I lose out on the other quarter, that's when it looks like it's deficient. If you're coming out with more, and it's resulting in you can show the, the data in terms of job placement, career placement, that kind of thing. It has some potential. It really does. And, and, and so I support it. I think it's a good idea. Um, I'm glad that the two people that are involved in the study, that are spearheading the study, I'm glad that they're doing the amount of research that they're doing because the article talked about that. It talked about the, first of all, they're taking a cohort of like 12 schools, part of their consultation in the pilot. And it's a wide range of schools. It's like schools in the in the East Coast, Midwest, South Southeast, West Coast, and it's a range of sizes. It's public, private. You know, it's mostly so uh, modestly selective and non-selective institutions. Um, but but those are some of the people that would be the most cost sensitive. And so I think that it's a good cohort for them to to you know experiment with. And they're talking to everybody from parents, you know, to everyone to get input. 
So I like the research they're putting into it, and it's going to be interesting to track it. I personally think that it has potential because while you have programs out there like University of Iowa, you know, the three-year program there and others that have have the three-year program, I mean, universities, Iowa's degree in three has been around for kind of a long time. The thing about those programs that differs them from this is those are like those are basically cram programs, Dave. Right. Like they don't change anything that you do in the four years. They just cram it. Sacrifice everything to one goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you got to like for for those programs like you're, you know, hopefully you get a bunch of AP credit, dual enrollment, CLEP or IB, so you're coming with a chunk of credits right there. Both my kids had about a half a year, although Davidson wouldn't take credit, wouldn't take uh Karis's, but Georgia took Joyce. So you you get a bunch of credits that way, and then you take a bunch of extra credit hours. Maybe you take 17 a semester instead of 15, and then maybe you go a summer, and then you get there that way. But, you know, that's a pretty intense place. You're still giving up a lot of things, giving up, uh, you know. And and the thing is, the whole college system is not set up for this. And so I don't underestimate the tradition you're going against, the culture you're going against. And one of the things that I really, when I read the article, I thought, ooh, snap, that could be a challenge is athletics. Yeah. You know, it's things like that that make me think that, 30 years from now, the three-year degree still won't be the normative main thing that, you know, supplants the four-year degree. I think we're in agreement with that, Dave. This is a good solution. We like it, but it probably at best would be probably 10 to 15 percent of the population. I do want to add that I think there's a big, great advantage when you can merge a three-year degree with a two-year uh, graduate degree to have a four-year degree. So you have wonderful synergies. We've talked about that in a couple of your college spotlights. University of London comes to mind, uh, where they have, I believe, Mark, a three-year degree combined with a master's so that in four years you can get a BA master's degree. And then they follow it up with internship opportunities and visas that allow you to take advantage of that even if you're a foreigner. So I I love those uh, combined degree concepts. uh, And there's a lot of them. That's right. There's a lot of them that, you know, that we've talked about these at, at a lot of schools, most recently RPI, Rentalier. Remember the famous Rentalier? That's right. That's <laughs> Rentalier right. Rentalier has a RPI. lot of these pro- yeah. <laughs> RPI. That's right. SLU. Yeah. SLU has a lot of these programs. I mean, Rollins. Rollins got a great five year MBA. I mean, there's just so, there's actually quite honestly too many of them to even, even mention. And yeah, and so that's a that's an example of 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 creativity. I just love to see creativity. I like to see options. That's right. The the, the famous many there are there used to be and less so now. Most MD BSN programs were uh you know uh, MD uh, BA combined BSMD. yeah BSMDs. They they used to be uh, some as short as six years, most seven years. I believe now most are eight There's years. one still six-year one, but yeah. it's still in Kansas City, but it's just so intense. Yeah, it is. It is. Actually, one of the families I'm working right now, the mom had gone through that program, and she said, when she's back there, I've never seen anybody look so miserable. Yeah. The the, the tricky part with that is just, there's just a foundational amount of knowledge and maturity and experiences that I think those programs have found that you know, having that extra year, they just found like that extra year. And I'm not sure if it was more the maturity or the extra content, but so many of those programs now are either eight year programs or seven years. And, and, and you got to throw a summer in there, like BU's program. I know, but you know what? The guy that pulled it off, Doogie Hauser, he got his own TV show. So <laughs> Doogie Hauser, man. You know, when you go TV, you know, when you go pop culture on me, you you're going to lose me. Is that a Doogie? movie? Doogie Howser. Am I supposed to know that? Is that something I'm supposed to know? Doogie Howser, MD. He was all. He was a 16 year old kid who basically became a doctor. He was a genius, and so he walked around in sneakers, like making all these wild diagnoses and like outsmarting all the 50 year old docs. Yeah, Doogie Howser. Is this a cartoon? What is Doogie Howser? What is this? It was a TV a show, show or a movie? It's cartoon. Show. What is it? Yeah, the guy came. Oh. Yeah, he, then he went on with some other TV show. But Doogie, oh man, you're, you're going to get some inbox emails, man. You don't know Doogie Howser. <laughs> Everybody who listens to this knows, knows I'm clueless anyway. Oh, man. <laughs> Ignore him you, listening, you should not be. You should not be oh manning me. You should know, but know this by now. You know me my whole life. Don't know Doogie Howser. <laughs> okay. I, what kind of name is that, man? <laughs> 
Doogie Hauser, MD, dude, look it up. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness! Didn't know your cosmo kid would be talking about some dude named Doogie, Doogie Hauser. <laughs> That's listening, folk. Educate my man. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right, let's. I think that's a wrap. <laughs> awesome. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, on our questionnaire, one of our podcast listeners sent in um, a request that I would talk about some of the trends that I'm seeing in admissions. And so, uh, you know, I'm a talker, so that led to a four-part series. This is the fourth and final uh, part. Um, it's the longest, but I think it contains some of the best and most val invaluable nuggets. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy our final part of Lisa and I discussing college admissions trends. All right, what do we have next? We have growth of using wait lists as the new ED3. All right. So this has started yeah, maybe five years or so ago, but it's really picking up steam and acceleration with the more competitive schools. So it's only the more competitive schools that even have wait lists. You know, if you're just struggling to fill your enrollment, you're going into August to fill your, you know, put butts in the seats and put heads in the beds, then you're not thinking wait lists. So this is one of the more competitive things for the more competitive schools that don't like to waste admission officers and people office offers on people that aren't going to come. Um, wait lists are growing and they're the new ED3. And by ED3, we mean early decision three. Now, how does it work? Well, what you do is you wait list somebody that you might have really, really wanted, but you don't think they're going to come. And then you sort of make them prove to you that they want they really want to come by going through the whole wait list process. And then if you think you may need them, you put feelers out and say, we might have a spot available, but we're going to need to know, you know, within 48 hours or even sometimes a week whether you're going to come or not. And a lot of schools sort of game their statistics. What I mean by that is, let's say, so in effect, they're giving you an offer. Let's say you say, well, I'm not really, really sure right now. I need more time. They, they don't count that as an accept in their statistics. They only count it if you come. And so that keeps their acceptance rate down. It increases their yield. And this is why I do not like the term safety school, unless it's a school that admits by numbers. Because, and I, I just this week alone, I had to correct three people for using that term safety school for schools that you're not guaranteed a spot. I can remember this, Lisa, like it was yesterday. I can remember this girl running through, I worked at a boarding school, you know, that doing college counseling. I can remember this girl running through the halls crying. And, you know, I ended up talking to her, consoling. Well, she never got in, quote unquote, safety school. And that's devastating to somebody psychologically. So, you know, when students use that term safety school, they have to be very careful because there are a lot of schools out here that if they don't think you're coming, they'll waitlist you and make you prove to them that you really want to come. And you could, and sometimes in some instances, you can almost be punished for being too strong of a student in an applicant pool because the stronger you are, the more they look at it and say, you know, we don't really get that many kids like this. So let's see if they want to come. Right. Which makes it hard as a college counselor because you're trying to build a list with balanced lists and you have to be really careful that now I'll, I'll call them probables. I'll call them high probables. Uh, but I don't lose that term safety unless they just admit by the numbers because school more and more schools are using this. It's a way of keeping your acceptance rate down, which is one of the ways that people judge schools, by the way, what the acceptance rate is. So colleges are smart. They know that. So they don't like to waste acceptances on people that are coming. And when I say colleges, you have to be very careful. There are a lot of schools that don't do this at all. Most schools don't do this. So I want to make that really clear. When I say colleges, I don't want people to think this is what everybody does. But there's a subset of schools that's trying to sort of climb up in the proverbial pecking order. And they figured one way they can do that is by lowering their acceptance rate. And so this is kind of the gimmicky way of doing it. And I hate to say this, but as someone who's done admissions, like we never did this, but I, this absolutely works. Like this is a, it's, a, it's in a sinister way. It's kind of an evil genius plan. Yeah. Yeah. To this, I say boo. <laughs> I do not like this trend. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. 
if you're, let's say, a very prestigious university, you're going to fill your class. The only reason you're doing this is for marketing. And in the process, you're upsetting like maybe hundreds to a thousand kids. Um, and I just think it's not the yeah, we can do a lot of things that are effective, but we don't do them because they're not humane. I feel like this is an inhumane way of doing admissions. I don't like it, but I also understand the pressure people are under. Like, you could be in a situation, because the more uncertainty that's out there, the more people apply to more schools. The more people apply to more schools, the, decre the more it decreases your chances of getting them. And let's say you're a school that accepts traditionally 38% of kids, okay? And if that number goes to 48%, you might not have your job. Like, so I also understand that side of it. Like, like everybody from who you report to, to the alumni, they're going to perceive that as the admission office is lowering the standards of our school. They're, they're admitting more people. So that's, that's kind of the other side is like people feel an incredible amount of pressure to, in certain schools, that people are watching these statistics like a hawk. And it's very, very difficult to balance that when people apply to more and more schools to keep your numbers where they're at. So I'm, I don't like it, but I also understand why people feel pressure to do it. I don't know if that makes sense. No, I understand what you're saying completely. I feel like this is a modern capitalist problem because people are directly incentivized for very short-term goals. Now, I think long-term, mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. whole waitlist strategy is probably bad for all those schools. They burn mm -hmm. people. They're going to get a bad reputation. They've certainly made me unhappy. Not that that will affect them in any way. <laughs> the but, powerful lease are up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it won't, but I'm just saying I'm not the only one. But like, so, but short-term, yeah, somebody gets their bonus or they don't get fired, but long-term, what path are they putting the institution on? And I just, I see this happen in so many different industries. And it's just really sad to me that it's happening in education in an allegedly nonprofit environment. Yeah. I mean, I think the only thing that I would disagree on that is people are so drawn to something that's hard to get. So when schools do anything that increases their scarcity, it does tend to increase their appeal. The harder they, the harder they're perceived to get in, the more people want to go. So it's not all on the schools. That's sort of the perverse psychology of the applicant feeding into this frenzy as well. Does that make any sense or not? It does. It does. I just don't think it justifies the behavior. I mean, yeah. like I said, I mean, I see that it works. I mean, it, it's it does make a lot of sense if you take out everyone's feelings and well-being, <laughs> you know, then it's great. But I, I'm putting the feelings and well-being back in there and saying, eh, I don't know if it's worth it from a larger perspective. Yeah. And, and the way this can play itself out is somebody can get a letter that can say, you know, your application looks strong or an email. And if and if you really want to come here, I think we will probably be able to get you off the wait list. Um, the bad part about it, that's the back half of it. The first half of it was why you got waitlisted in the first place. In other words, I think what it comes down to is this. From an applicant standpoint, you kind of want to know that if you met the standard and you were desirable, that you should get an offer. But this is where the disconnect is. The goal in admissions is not to give you an offer or to give you a trophy. The goal in admissions is to enroll, enroll the most gifted and talented class. And so this is where the two of them are kind of at odds with each other. And so this, this is a tactic can result in you increasing the quality of your class because people will, your acceptance rate is going to go down. That's going to lead more people to one, either apply or to actually pick you. It's the same thing we were talking about before about scholarships. Like, right, you got a $15,000, $20,000 scholarship, you feel like, oh, wow, this is great. I feel honor has been conferred on me. Now I'm more likely to go. It's kind of the same thing. Like, wow, I got into that school and they had like a 14% acceptance rate. We have to find a way of making this work. So it increases your yield. People will be more willing to pay more money for that. So all of the incentives in the system are kind of aligned that this is effective just from a standpoint of what admission officers are told to do. So I don't know. It's really, I'm not, I don't want to sit around here and say that I'm justifying it. I know it probably sounds like I am, but I, I do understand why people do it as, as much as I don't like it. Yeah, Let's no, it's, it's understandable. <laughs> it's just, it depresses me, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Friends, as I was editing this episode, I said to myself, snap, 
everything you said about how colleges use wait lists is 100% correct. But why did you limit yourself stuck only to wait lists? You see, wait lists occur when you apply in the regular round. But the exact same thing is occurring to people who apply in the early round. Here we use the word deferred or deferral. Now maybe it's because I just went through the early round, so this is fresh on my mind, but this is how it works in the early round. A student applies early action to a school. Remember, early action is an early deadline, an early notification, but it's non-binding. Now the college wants the student, but they fear they are being used as a backup. So they put out feelers and attempt to flip the student from early action, which remember is non-binding, to ED, which is binding. Just in December of this year, that's right, 2022, I experienced the following schools doing this. And yes, I'm naming names. Tulane, who has gained a national reputation for effectively flipping EA applicants to ED, the University of Chicago, Case Western, University of Miami, and Babson. And that's just me, one counselor, and just one year. So you know it's much more widespread than this. In fact, this practice is becoming so prevalent that consider me skeptical now when a school that offers early decision also adds an early action or an EA option to their ED. Now, this doesn't mean every school that has ED and EA is doing this, but consider me a skeptic. When Jeff Shipman was at Tulane, he was very public one year about flipping 95 kids from EA to ED by communicating to an early action applicant that if they want to switch their applicant application to early decision, they have a home at Tulane. Other admission officers took note. And I noticed this attempt to flip a strong EA applicant that you think you probably were not going to yield to ED more with the current seniors than with any other class of students I worked with from 2001 to 2020 that applied early. Now, this should not be surprising because the pandemic blew up so many of the predictive metrics schools use to build their yield models. Remember, the job of admissions is not to... Um, acknowledge to you that you met the admission standard and therefore you're worthy of admission and therefore you deserve acceptance offer. The job of admission is to enroll your class. So, like I said, the pandemic blew up some of the productive metrics schools used to build the yield models. And it also led to some students applying to even more schools. So this relatively new wrinkle is one way colleges can figure out who amongst all of these applicants is actually going to come if we make an offer. I know, I know what you're thinking. Just when you think this opaque process, this Byzantine process, couldn't get even more complex, it does exactly that, adds another wrinkle and gets even more complex. We'll talk about something happier now. I yeah. don't know if it's happier or not, but applicants <laughs> sure. increasingly postponing visits until they see where they are admitted. Yeah, so I think, you know, this started some time ago, but I really, I really think this accelerated during the pandemic because you really couldn't visit. And then people applied to more schools and they said, let me see where we got in. Or maybe you wanted to visit and you couldn't hardly get in. And so I see this just with people that I work with. Like, I have more and more people that almost don't even think that it's the norm to visit ahead of time for out-of-state stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, why not, well, why would I, why not just wait till I see where I got in and then go? And certainly that's not the majority of people, but I definitely see that as a, grow, as a growing trend. And then with that, let's transition to the last one. Sure. Increased use of virtual offerings and use of tracking engagement. Right. So, right. So now the cyber visits the new visit as a result of this. Mm -hmm. And now... Schools can track and see whether or not you did that cyber visit as a reflection of your interest in the school, your engagement in the school. They did it before for in-person visits, but there was always a queasiness before about it because they knew that they were doing something that was so uh, biased toward families with resources. Right, right. And so some schools imposed rules like Harvard for College for years has had a 150-mile rule. And I remember when Kane Willis was there, he was, I, I really like Kane. He was really transparent as an admission officer. And he would just tell people straight up, like, hey, if you live within 150 miles of Haverford, you don't interview, you're not getting in. 
So they would use that as a test. They would say, so some schools, that was their way of striking a balance between using in, using visits as an indication of interest versus not punishing people that live in Seattle and they're interested in Haverford, right? Right, right. So, and a lot of schools do that. Like, they have a different standard for if it's in your backyard versus if you're, you know, multiple states away. But now there's kind of no excuse. They're not going to say, well, maybe if family doesn't have the internet. They're not going to say that. They're going to be like, you have a computer, you have an internet. If you're not in, if you're not engaging with us and we're offering all this free content, then you're signaling to us that we're a backup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's using virtual offerings as a way of connoting um, demonstrated interest or the lack thereof. Right. Well, I think that's fine as long as everyone knows the score, right? Um, that, that families know that and kids know that. I will say, you know, I do think like I, I have been working with a student and she did so many virtual visits um, and this uh-huh. is a low income student, but then her mom was able to scrape enough money together to take her to visit different schools and it completely changed her perspective. So, I mean, I do think that having the opportunity, if you can, to go visit a school in person, it's um, gives you so much more information, but you certainly can rule out schools on these virtual offerings. I know. I mean, it's certainly better if you can do it, if you can visit, absolutely, um, get some in. But, I, you know, you mentioned something. It's okay if everybody knows that this is how it's done, but they don't know unless they're listening to right. like podcasts like this, right? That's not something, well, sometimes somebody will come, will share that, but most of the time they won't. Uh, sometimes they do, but for the most, the most of the public does not know this. Yeah. And I don't understand why, you know, it would be perfectly fine for admissions departments to say, we do track whether or not you attend these sessions and we use it to gauge your interest in our school. I mean, I, I think you could just put that on your website and just be, you know, loud and proud about it. And I mean, I think that's reasonable and fair and pretty much in our virtual world, that's how our preferences or interests are always tracked. But, you know, if you're just not saying that and but you're using that as a metric, you know, I guess they don't want people just to put it on and then go, you know, do the dishes and then put another school on and vacuum right. the house. But I mean, I don't think most people are that devious or have that kind of time. Well, you'd be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> I know what devious, <laughs> but <laughs> I can. I mean, I have I have mixed feelings on this one. Um, I always respect it when they do share that. And schools have done this over the years, right? Like sometimes, even in the old days, when you go to a fair and and, the, and you and you have an inquiry card there, um, is very 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 common for someone to say, "Ah, oh, that's okay. I don't need an inquiry card. I'm already on your mailing list." It's very common for an admission officer to say, oh, we track we track that. Go ahead and fill it out. Mm-hmm. So there's a side of it when they do do that. But there's another side of it where this is how, well, I'll, I'll use this example. I don't know if you remember me sharing this before in the podcast, Lisa, but there was a school, which I won't mention, they used to do interviews. It was for scholarships. And one of the admission officers, it was so funny. She was they they so you stu- people would wait out until in the lobby until they until they would call you to come in for your interview. And so one of the admission officers like would be out in the lobby, baseball cap, sunglasses, oh, you know, man. do a little incognito thing and, oh. and watch and watch and observe how everybody kind of interacted with each other in in the room. Now, if they told you that's what they do, they would not get authentic behavior. Right. So so this kind, this is why sometimes they don't share this stuff, you know, because now you're just going to open the email and pretend you're looking at something while you're on your phone or whatever. So it's tricky. Like what well, somebody very recently said to me when I was interviewing them, they said, Mark, I'm not going to reveal all of, our, all of our secret sauce. And I respected that. Like I kind of get that other side as well. So that's why you listen to a podcast like this to get that's some right. of those tips. I, you know, I tell my kids, like, anytime you set foot in a school that you are applying to, you are being evaluated from the moment you get there to the moment you leave and keep that in mind. And, you know, whenever you're having any interaction, email, phone call, web, you're always being watched. But, you know, that I just, I know that. So I communicate that to my kids and I would encourage all parents to communicate that to their kids. Yeah. So these are just 14, you know, trends, things I'm watching, observing, noticing, um, I thought it was a great question. I can't, I, I thank you by name for asking it, but we don't ask for names on the questionnaire, but whoever asked that, 
Uh, something I try to really keep tabs on is trends. And as I observe new ones um, and see them happening, I'll be happy to come back and bring them to you guys. So that's all I got today, Lisa. Well, that is a lot. And I think these are a lot of um, really thoughtful, great predictions. And it'll be interesting to see what the future holds for us all in this regard. Well, Lisa knows this, but we started this conversation about three or four weeks ago, and I kept texting her. My list just started getting longer and longer. <laughs> I started with three, remember? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, see, but that, you know, that's that's good. That's a mark of a creative and, and genius mind, right? Just keep <laughs> elaborating on these ideas until you come up with really deep thoughts. I'll take creative and genius. Let's stop right there. All that's right. We're going to end on that one. All right. <laughs> Hello, friends. Hello, Lisa. You know what time it is. It's time for me to have a 15th trend, even though I said we were going to do 14. I bet there's going to be a 16th trend. That's no, my future I promise trend you. prediction. I promise you. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. We talked about how we're recording these multi-episode um, uh, podcasts at once so that we could have a bit of a break over the holidays. Mm-hmm. But this is not when we've done that. We keep recording these separate segments. And- <laughs> So you give me four weeks, that's dangerous for my mind to start, you know, reflecting and coming up with it. No, but, and honestly, this is a trend that I thought about sharing at the very, very, very start. And in complete transparency, I said, you know what, this is going to be controversial. People don't like when you talk about political stuff. Maybe I won't even delve there. But it just became so overwhelmingly evident that I need to discuss it. And my view on political stuff is... If it's just some arbitrary, off-the-cuff, willy-nilly comment, then, yeah, I'll avoid that because, you know, it's divisive and people don't like it. But when politics interfaces with education and higher education, I'm not avoiding it. Those are the issues, and we're going to talk about them. And and there's a lot of things that fall in that category, and this is one. So what are we referring to? Uh, we're talking about the right-wing backlash um, against curriculum that is considered uh, racially sensitive curriculum that exposes some of the historical transgressions that have happened in the past. And there's a massive backlash right now. You know, it started with the critical race theory. Um, you know, Fox News tested that and it just it just took off like a lightning rod. I mean, it got their audience just responded to that like crazy. And so they ran umpteen stories on it, became super popular in the Virginia governor's race. And right now it's a huge movement, which is, you know, critical race theory was the idea. It was actually a theory taught in law school that that racism is not so much individual incidents, but it's more like smog that's in the air that that you imbibe when you breathe because of the history. It's been it's been a part of the fabric of the country, whether it's three fifths of a person in the Constitution or other things. And so you need to understand America, you need to understand how it impacts laws and regulations and policies in in every area. And so there was a backlash against that, but that was really a law school theory. And so a lot of people were like, well, we're not really talking about this law school theory in K-12 elementary. But in reality, that was more of a symbolism that people were saying, stop having curriculum that's producing white guilt in my child. That's really what that's really what people were saying. I don't want to read Toni Morrison, James Baldwin. I don't want to read anything that is making my child feel some sense of guilt or feel bad or feel like white people did something they shouldn't have done. And so it's led. That's where it started. And it's growing. And it, and to not talk about this as a trend would be to be a, do a disservice and to be negligent. Um, I want to read something. But before I do, any thoughts, Elisa? Well, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts, but why don't you go ahead and read what you want to read first, and I'll try to weave them into the discussion. Yeah, so I was going to, I was going to, you know, there's the straw that broke the camel's back for me, and I wish I remember the school, but recently it went down last week. A college literally announced they were dropping political science completely because of this issue, because they felt like it was stirring up too much controversy. And and so they're going to drop political science completely, which is absurd. Yeah. Um, and so I was going to comment on that. And then literally today, a story comes out. This is an inside higher ed. It is called a template for academic freedom. Professors seek a united faculty voice against legislative incursions into the curriculum with respect to teaching race. I'll just read a little bit of it here. It says academics need a tougher, more organized response to the wave of state legislations or governing board policies that are limiting 
the teaching of race, and so-called divisive concepts. That's the thinking behind an effort to get as many faculty senators as possible to adopt a resolution demanding academic freedom to teach about race and gender, justice, and critical race theory. And then it goes on to to talk about all the people behind it and how this is not just K-12 and how they're getting trying to get solidarity to teach, you know, their expertise and not and not have the public dictate to them what they're allowed to teach. Um, just a couple of things I'll, I'll mention that that it goes on to talk about here. Uh, it's Jennifer Ruth, a professor of film studies at Portland State, who co-wrote the template with Johnson and Emily Ho. Uh, Gustavus Henry Wald, professor of law and contracts at the University of Cincinnati. They praised the joint st- statement on academic freedom. Um, and they went on, goes on to talk about other schools that are experiencing this incursion um, from, you know, from basically the backlash. It talks about the Colorado Board's resolution that's going on right now and basically how the curriculum is being undermined. It talks about the Senate at Ohio State recently passed a resolution similar to the template. And so, you know, this is an issue. And to not talk about this as a trend uh, would, would, would really be remiss. And especially, uh, you know, the, the governor of Virginia, he ran on this platform and won on it. So this is seen as a winning issue and it's happening, the fights over school boards. And, you know, I was talking with Dave about this and uh, it's, it's the equivalent of the patient coming into the doctor and telling the doctor, this is what I want you to do. Right, right. So I just want to take a breather and get and get your thoughts. And, and, well, and then... I mean, honestly, I don't – I have never – and I'm a white person, obviously. I have never heard – No, you taught me something <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> the whitest white person ever. But I have, Missouri. <laughs> I have never really heard a, a kid come in and say, I feel bad about myself because of something that happened 50 years ago. Um, my son recently took a class um, that I signed him up for on OutSchool about Jim Crow laws because he was homesick and he was bored. And he uh-huh. was horrified and we talked about it, but I don't think he felt personally responsible. I think he just felt like we shouldn't have done it then. And, uh-huh. you know, we shouldn't certainly do something like that in the future. So I think that it makes I think it makes adults uncomfortable. Certainly the history that I am now come to learn is very different than what I was taught in school, in elementary, junior high, and high school. And that's, it's upsetting. It's disappointing to realize that, you know, we are taught that America is the land of the free and the brave. But then when you really look at it, there are a lot of places where people were neither, they weren't free. Well, a good example is as you look at the the slaughter of hundreds of people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, exactly. and it went. I never learned about that. Yeah, people people never even and there's so many other things like that yeah. that people never learned, and and so what what you know I always want to come up with practical things when we talk about a trend. So what I would say is, it's important whatever whatever your view is on the political spectrum. Um, when you're looking at a school, you should ask these questions if this is important to you. Absolutely. You know, how are you, what, you know, what are you teaching in regards to history and racial and race and in America and find out where they're, where, where they are? Because I mean, like DeSantis is putting laws in place, attempting to put laws in place to prohibit certain things from being taught, which goes against everything when it comes to academic freedom. And there's this movement that's saying, parents, you have the power to dictate what, you know, what your teachers teach you. Um, I mean, I I think I'm all for listening. So I, I do believe in listening sessions, you know, and I, I think there's nothing wrong with sitting around and listening to to what people have to say. And maybe sometimes there are some valid points. Um, I don't believe it necessarily just plug your ears and not hear what anybody has to say on any topic. But... Um, this is a trend, and the and the trend is to change curriculum in a way to not bring up the past in ways that makes people feel uncomfortable when it comes to teaching on the topic of race. And so, to to neglect mentioning this would be to do a disservice. If people don't like it, then they don't like it. I'm sorry, that's the truth, and I'm not going to hide it. Well, yeah, and I do think like you know you have to be an educated consumer. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, Lily was admitted to the University of Florida and, you know, considered that. But I'm very glad she's not there. I mean, she probably would have been transferring. I mean, she's a brown person, you mm-hmm. know, being <laughs> adopted from India. So, I mean, I don't think she would have. You, you just know, said that so cavalierly, <laughs> but I don't know if you've ever told our audience that, have you? Oh, yeah. I don't know. But my oldest daughter, Lily, we adopted her from India when she was three months old. She was born in Pune, India. Um, and I stayed in India with her and my husband's relatives for four months, which was probably like the hardest and most awesome time of my life all wrapped up into one. Um, so, you know, nobody in our family looks like anybody else. I always, I think one of my pediatricians once told me y'all are like, um, a bunch of people waiting for the bus. (laughs) (laughs) That is so funny. Yeah. He also had like uh, a daughter adopted from Korea and a daughter adopted from Guatemala. So his family was also a bunch of people waiting for the bus. <laughs> so um, he, can say, he, he can say it. Right. But um, so but, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't want her to be in that situation. I think I had mentioned to you, Mark, that, um, you know, we've been looking at some private schools um, mm-hmm. in the area here and we went to a tour of one and the diversity I guess she was the head of diversity as woman. She was standing in the middle of the hallway. And anytime a group of people walked in, she said, I just want you to know that we teach diversity in this school, in every single class, in every possible conceivable way. And if you don't like it, please do not apply to this school. And I was just like, wow. I mean, I mean, that's great. I would want you to do that. But like the fact that you have to say that very forcefully to people was kind of my husband and I are both a little taken aback by that. Just that no, but that's a good example. It shows it. this trend. It shows that yeah. this trend is that people are feeling pressure and and they need to either come out and say where they stand. Um, and, and so it's a growing trend, which is, you know, parents dictating to mm-hmm. to school and schools and school boards and leaders uh, what they want their curriculum. Of course, you know, Nicole Hannah Jones, you know. Oh, my gosh. I mean, well, that's tore yeah. up, you know, UNC Chapel Hill. And the, the fallout is still happening from that. There's so Why don't much... you share that? Because that's something not everybody might know what we're talking about. I think Nicole Hannah Jones um, was the originator of the 1619 Project. Yes. And that was published in the New York Times. And she talked about um, the theory that, um, you know, racism in the United States is not only like interpersonal, but it's structural. Like, so institutions... Right. Um, kind of perpetuate racism, even if individuals don't. And I mean, if you look at the actual data, I mean, mm-hmm. there's you cannot argue with her. I mean, th- that right. is just the facts. People intended yeah. to do it. I mean, that's sure. just the way it was. And so she was um, offered a professorship at UNC Chapel Hill in the journalism department. And she, it was assumed that that would be a tenured position because she, I think she won a Pulitzer Prize. She is such an esteemed journalist and she would be great for the students. And and she's, yeah, in addition to being highly accomplished, she's also an alum. Right, yeah. right. So, but the journalism school is funded in large part by a man, and I forget his name, but he is, he ran a newspaper in Arkansas, and it's very right-wing newspaper, and that's where his money come from, and he put up a fuss, basically, that he would not continue to donate to the school if this happened. And in addition, as you know, North Carolina, like, although UNC Chapel Hill is a very liberally oriented institution. The state government is very conservative. And so the state government elects the board of trustees and the board of governors. They appoint them. And so they're kind of, so they're people making these decisions. And most of the time they were just rubber stamping whatever professors recommended, but this time they didn't. And they basically drew it out and, and were refusing to offer her tenure and then there was a lot of protesting. The students um, then, you know, went to the board of trustees. They were, some of them were forcibly removed. It was quite the thing. But they did prevail and they did offer to give her tenure. But at that point, decided she had enough of us. And she went to Howard, which I hardly can blame her for. Sure. So it just was a huge stain, I think, for the school. Well, I'll tell you another story. So, uh, you know, I, I do still do a little bit of boarding school admissions. I used to do a lot. I used to be, be like half boarding, half college. Now it's like 3% of what I do. But this is a boarding school family I'm working with. And and they said, we can't look at Middlesex. I, I do not like what they did to to, to Nicole Hannah-Jones. We can't, you know, we can't, we're not down with that. And I hadn't heard of that. What, what, what happened? So Nicole Hannah-Jones is a good friend that works at Middlesex. It's a, you know, prestigious boarding school outside of Boston. And 
her friend had arranged for her to come be a keynote speaker. And it was approved. Everything was good. And all of a sudden, the headmaster disinvites her to be a speaker. Hmm. So make a long story short, he got fired over it. The faculty was beside themselves. The students were revolting. Like, what are you doing? But we bring this up just to show that this is a contentious issue. To not talk about this as a trend um, would be remiss. And it yeah. is. And 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 with the governor of of uh, Virginia really running on this issue. I mean, he, you know, he, he talked about other things, too. He was savvy in some of the things he did in terms of gas – you know, rolling back gas taxes and things. But he made this a clear platform in, in his campaign, is fighting critical rights theory and parents basically having more input on what the curriculum is. Um, you know, it ensures it's going to spread. Is it, yes. Right now it appears to be an animating issue with certain people and, and that just, you know, emboldens it and you're seeing it spread. Uh, state by state by state, and it's going to be a big fight and a big war, and and not just a one year thing. This is going to be something over the next decade, and so. Well, I just wonder, like, will private schools have more freedom to study things as they wish than public schools who have to conform to what state legislatures want? I mean, that even could be like public high schools. I know in North Carolina, teachers are required to post their social studies curriculum. I don't know where they post it. I haven't seen it. I would be interested to see it just because I want to learn more about social studies. But, sure. you know, like, so that parents can comment on it, like there's some kind of, unless they're also a social studies teacher or a historian, I don't know. So I, I mean, will even public schools uh, from K through, you know, 12 through state flagships, be more limited in what they can teach about this? Will private schools choose? Yeah, I mean, it's all, it, it, it can go, it could be either because it depends who, who you know, who's in power, whoever yeah. in power, whatever their political persuasion is. Yeah. You know, in one sense, private schools have the freedom to not be dictated above about what you can do. But the other thing about private schools a lot of times is the parents have so much power and so much influence because they're paying. Right, right. So, the you know, so anyway, I think we've beat this one up enough, but that's a trend. And I promise it's the last one. Oh, I <laughs> We have know. other content to get on. We have great questions listeners are sending in yeah. that we have well, to get on to. I just have one people. final comment is that, you yeah. know, like I, I feel very – as a white person, I feel badly about the way – that um, white, you know, in the history that white Americans have treated people of other races, and that pretty much starts off when they stepped on this continent, you know, it just, and it kind of went from bad to worse, but I don't feel ashamed about that. What I feel ashamed of now is the way that people are manipulating other people using their fears and, you know, um, to get them to do what they want. And I think critical race theory is a dog whistle. And I think it, it touches on some kind of white fear that they're losing their place in the world. And, um, you know, that makes me ashamed more than anything else, you know, because that's what we're doing right now. So, well, God bless you for speaking up, you know, and I think it's important that it's, it's about the It's just about the truth. You know, yeah, it's just about right. standing for the truth. And, right. you know, you 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 learn from your history so you don't repeat it. Exactly. Exactly. You know? yeah. I had a client who told me she was mad about um, a political falsehood that someone had told her and she just lost it with this person. She says, all right, there are three kinds of information. There's facts, there are lies, and there are mistakes. And that's it. So it's either true, it's a lie, or you 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 messed up. And I think a lot of this stuff is just lies. I mean, obviously, with history, there's two versions or 10 versions to every story, but certain things are pretty set in stone. They actually happen. We have lots of evidence from lots of sources to prove they actually happen. I'm pretty sure we can believe that happened. You know, and I, and to deny that, I don't know. It's psychotic to me. Yeah, and and once again, I just want to say that um, whatever your view is, um, find out what schools are teaching on these issues. Absolutely. So that you can um, know what you're walking into and know what's going on, because there's a lot going on right now, and yeah. academic freedom is more. under assault. Academic, you know, and I, I think it's pretty arrogant for people. Um, to feel that they can dictate to educators what they should learn. 
Uh, and he really is analogous. Like I don't walk in the doctor and tell the doctor everything he's supposed to tell me about, you know, my body. Like he's the expert. Right. And they need to defer right. to him and have some deference. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, I think that there's a part of the way that people, I think, are manipulated by this is they are they're giving a false sense of power. Yeah, you don't have to, like, listen to what the historians say. You can believe whatever you want. You don't have to listen to the research on vaccines. You can believe whatever you want. And and by like that's how they loosen people away from the truth. You know, and they feel like that they know everything, but really it's just so you can feed them misinformation. And it's, it's really awful to watch as a psychologist. It's terrible to watch. All right, Lisa, our, our passions are getting All animated right, here. I'm so sorry. I'm no, sorry. no, no, no. Wait, you know what? We, if, if, if one thing you can never say, we don't, we keep it real. <laughs> that was real, we keep real. It real. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, in part four of my interview with Michael Ireland from Smith College and Courtney Hatch Blavelt, currently at Miss Hall School, uh, we start out by talking about early estimates. Why are some schools offering these? How are they different from net price calculators? What's the difference? And is this a trend? Is this something we see catching on? Then Michael is asked, my child is applying to colleges that require the CSS profile. I'm divorced and the CSS profile is asking for my ex to complete the non-custodial parent profile, but he's never been reliable and I know he won't complete it. Is there any option for my child or does she just need to look at different schools? And Michael talks about the process they take at Smith when these dilemmas arise to try to work it out. So the student isn't hurt. Courtney speaks up about her experience, and she's very passionate. Courtney's then asked, my child was approved for work study. How does she actually get a work study job? And can she get a job in her major? She's planning on majoring in biology. Courtney shares how work study has worked at various schools she's worked at. And Michael chimes in and shares how work study has worked at the schools he's worked at. Then Michael's asked, what are some common mistakes he sees? that students and parents make on their financial ed paperwork, FAFSA and the profile. And Michael and Courtney start um, and chime in and share multiple mistakes that they have seen that are very common that students and parents make. Michael and Courtney actually start this question now, and they resume their answer next week on part five, our final part. Listen and enjoy. And so my next question is, Courtney, it's related, it's for you, and it's kind of related to a point you made earlier. And so it says, some schools like Franklin and Marshall offer an early estimate to students who apply early decision, which is different from the net price calculator. Will a school stand by their early estimate? And is this something other schools my child is considering will do if we ask them? And to me, this was almost similar to your screenshotting everything. It's different, but it's sort of like in that realm of like screenshotting everything and asking a school if they'll review it. Um, what do, what do you want to say on this one? Yeah, I actually, th this was a totally new concept to me. Um, so I immediately hit the Google and, um, read about F and M's policy and they do ask for everything up front. They ask for the tax returns and W2s. Um, so therefore I'd say it is, this is very different than a net price calculator. Like this is truly a, a, a going to be your financial aid unless they, I don't know what else they would ask for that would change anything significantly. Um, and the only other schools when I Googled that I could see clearly had this policy are Brown University and Hobart and William Smith College. So I do think maybe this will be a trend and it would be a positive trend. Um, I also know that a lot of schools will do this for athletes, recruited athletes, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but not they wouldn't do it for everyone applying ED. So I would say for families, like, start spreading the word that, like, well, these three schools are doing this, so can you do this? <laughs> and I think if there's Michael, enough... we keep putting more work <laughs> Sorry. on you, Michael. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> and then I think there should be advocacy to hire more people in financial aid. That's there another huge yeah, thing I would support. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, don't be afraid to ask, especially if, like we talked about, you're self-employed, you're an international family, or you're a business owner. Um and the language, again, about standing by an early award estimate, it's still called an estimate. And that's kind of the I college's know, know. way of saying, like, look, we can't promise anything, but this is probably going to be what it is. No, that's really helpful. I, um, I'm pretty sure Trinity University in San Antonio also does this. Oh, I, good. 
They uh, they tout that in their presentations. Um, but so what are your thoughts, Michael? As somebody who's in the saddle, how would you feel if somebody came to you and said, I really want to apply ID, but I'm really scared. I've heard net price calculators aren't always accurate. Like, um, I've, you know, I've heard some of the other schools do an early estimate. Um, is that something that you would oblige if that was requested? Or would you just say, we just don't have the manpower. I'm sorry, we can't do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And and I think, you know, as Courtney pointed out, I, I am going to imagine there are not very many schools that do this, in part because of the amount of work, because you're right. I mean, if they're going to give an accurate early estimate, they're going to ask for essentially all of the financial aid application material in order to do that and do that well. And and uh, and, it, and it would take a lot of people <laughs> to essentially do that for for the number of people, the number of students who would probably want it. And so. I think in our case, and probably the case of many colleges, you know, we would direct them to the net price calculator uh, and uh, to, to really say, you know, sorry, we can't give you this estimate and uh, we'll, we'll point you to the net price calculator, which is relatively accurate and give you an idea. And, and so that the, but, you know, as we talked about earlier, I mean, the danger of that is that uh, the, the ultimate financial aid award may be different than the net price calculator for a variety of reasons. And, uh, and so that the, the, uh, you know, I, you know, I hate to hate to really influence too heavily a student's decision to apply early decision uh, or just regular decision. But if if the finance, if you're if you're really concerned about the finances and financial aid, then then unfortunately, ultimately, maybe regular decision is the better way to go, because then you would potentially, assuming you get into a number of colleges, you'd have multiple financial aid awards to compare. It gives you additional time to have conversations with financial aid offices if you feel you need to appeal that that determination. So that that's the real struggle, I think, that the families probably face. Yeah, you know that, you know, this may not be what schools want to hear because I know it says when you apply your decision, you're admitted immediately, withdraw your applications right away. But when the family is not full pay, I tell them to not withdraw their applications until they see the money. Um, because you withdraw your applications and then the money comes out really different, you're screwed. And, and, and so I, it's just how I advise people, like when money's involved, I mean, some schools do a good job of getting the financial aid award back quickly after decision. Some schools don't. And you, you know that you're in and it's a long time before you see the, the aid award. Um, do you have an issue with that, Michael, or do you think that's okay? Well, I mean, I would say that that uh, you have you have to know what the situation is because I mean, sure. you know, the only the only out really for an early decision student is is for financial reasons. If the family, the student, the family determine they can't can't really pull it off, and so you can't make that decision unless you have that financial aid award uh, if you've applied for financial aid, and so so yeah, so I think it's critical to have that piece of information before making the decision about what to do for admission. Okay, so Michael, this one's for you initially. Courtney, chime in. Uh, my child is applying to colleges uh, that require the CSS profile. I'm divorced, and the CSS profile is asking for my ex to complete a non custodial parent profile, but he's never been reliable. I know he just will not complete this. Is there any option for my child, or does she need to apply to schools that do not require the CSS profile? Yeah, wow. That's a... <laughs> you probably have a headache because you've heard, dealt with this so many times. Yeah, I mean, it, well, actually, fortunately, I don't see it too often. But the times, they, but yeah, it's a great question mark because I mean, the 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 times that we do see this, you know, it's just a it's such a challenging situation for the student and the the the, the custodial parent, and uh, and it's you know, it's one of the most challenging things that I think we work with because we want to support the student, we want to be able to accurately assess their situation and and really help them and. Uh, and in cases, you know, in this situation, if we're not able to resolve it in any way, then ultimately the student would not be able to complete their financial aid application. And so we would not be able to do any kind of uh, need based assessment for the student. So so that's the real challenge. And yeah, super, super unfortunate. So, you know, so what what can a family do? I, I, you know, which is really what their, their question is. And. And the, the place to begin is uh, is communicating with individual colleges to uh, to see if they are able to waive out that non custodial parent and, and waive out essentially means that they're not going to ask for their material they're not going to count anything about that non custodial parent 
And uh, so different colleges have different approaches for that. Typically they'll have a, we have a form for that. <laughs> We've got a form for a lot of things. And so, so uh, it would typically involve, a, a, you know, form describing the relationship with that non-custodial parent, usually a statement from the student, often the, the, the custodial parent also, and then typically a, uh, a third party, uh, a high school guidance counselor, for example, <laughs> that, uh, for example, I'm sure Courtney may have written some of those in her time. And, and, uh, and so, uh, so that, that is an approach and to take with individual colleges to see if they'll waive out that person. And every college is going to be a little bit different on how strict they are with that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and often if it's just an unwillingness of that parent, uh, it may not be sufficient to waive the person out. But if there's a significant break in the relationship, then, yeah, then they're more likely to, to potentially, um, wave out that person and so so in my mind that would be um that would be the first step to do and uh and then if if that is not successful the the other piece that that we will do uh from our aid office and i would imagine <laughs> i'm gonna go on a limb here and say that other colleges would would consider doing this or do this is they would reach out directly to that non-custodial parent on behalf of the student in the family to, and really to, to explain to them, uh, you know, it, you know, even if it's just by email or even, you know, we'd be willing to have a conversation with them to explain that there's n absolutely no financial commitment to complete these forms and complete this process, first of all. So, so it's just a way to, for us to be able to evaluate the student's ability to pay for school. And then the second piece is that confidentiality is is such a critical thing in what we do that we would never uh, share information between different households. So the student and the custodial parent will never see any of the information that a non-custodial parent would submit uh, as part of the aid application process. So, so we'll, you know, we'll sometimes go directly to that non-custodial parent to share that. And, uh, and that in some cases will get some movement and uh, and have them complete the forms to so the student can, can complete that process. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. So friends, very excited about our recommended resource for episode 205. You you may have noticed our regular listeners at least that one thing that really fires me up is when I'm able to sort of peel back the onion and really sort of try to shed some light on um, how the sausage is made and what really goes into admissions decisions. And that's what this resource is going to do. And once again, thanks to one of our listeners, shout out to Mary Lynch. She sent this in to me. Um, and what it is, it's a case study at Rice University. Um, I love, 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 love case studies. I've participated in a lot of them. Um, they do their best to simulate what it's like to actually be in the admissions committee. And here they allow students to vote on who they would admit and not admit. And I think they just do a fantastic job. Um, it's two admission officers, Yvonne Romero da Silva. And if you recognize that name, she's the founder of CBE, Committee Based Evaluation. We've talked about that a lot when she was at Penn and Brandon Mack. And, you know, just for legal and some PR reasons, they refer to the university as Levitt University. Uh, those familiar with Rice may know that Lovett is one of the, the residential colleges at Rice, but it's clearly Rice University. What they do is they take you through four very different students from different parts of the country, and you get to see a lot of different things. You get to see the transcript and how it's looked at, grades, grade trends, courses, uh, school offerings, um, how your curriculum is judged in light of what's offered at your school, test scores, but then they go way beyond that. And you get an insight into things such as recommendations um, and extracurriculars and essays and the texture that comes in with the, the more subjective or softer aspects um, of the process. And you kind of get to see how the whole thing comes together. And so, of course, you can't completely simulate the real thing, but they do a, just a fantastic job. And it's up on YouTube. They, they did an application advice series with parts one and two and three, and the case studies is part three. Um, but you probably will find a hard time, uh, have a hard time finding that, although Bryce has a fantastic YouTube um, page. So what we'll do is we'll put the link up, and I strongly encourage you to listen to this and to watch this 
um, not only if you're interested in rights, but if you're interested in how any selective school uh, does holistic admissions. The one thing I will say is Rice does tend to look a lot more at um, how your academic uh, courses, grades, and interests align with your major interest than, say, a liberal arts school like a Wesleyan or a Davidson or an Occidental, um, but still extremely helpful because most people do apply to universities. We'll now resume my interview with our two esteemed guests discussing financial aid and paying for college. Anything you want to share on that, Courtney? Um, I guess just that, yeah, this gets re me really fired up because it. I'm surprised that Michael says he doesn't see it a lot because I saw it a yeah, lot. Yeah, I am too. Oh, <laughs> um, I saw it a lot in my previous jobs. I see it a lot now. And the situations are heartbreaking. And when a college is so insistent on getting this information, it really is emotionally damaging to the student and the family. I'm going through this right now with a student, with a college that I will not name, but I asked the student, do I can I reach out to this college after your process is done? And she said, yes. So next spring I am mm -hmm. on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just the loop, the hoops they make them jump through. Um, and sometimes, I mean, it's, I understand why, like some, I, I know that some families will try to take advantage of it, but I feel like that amount is so much smaller than the amount of families that this really impacts. Um, and I just, I would encourage, and especially for first gen low income students, it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, you can tell I get fired up. So I, if for yeah. any colleges out there listening, I really implore you. And I, honestly, I think a lot of admissions officers don't realize the, their policies at their schools. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like more should know and try to make changes um, and try to really review. I, I think, again, at Williams, I think when I started, they were much stricter on this and gradually they have become less. So and again, Williams can afford to do that. Um, but like my, my alma mater, Gettysburg, like that's not a super rich mm -hmm. school, but they decided, right. look, right. this isn't even worth the trouble. We're just going to ask for custodial. So anyway, that's my soapbox. <laughs> yeah. And for those of you, you know, um, maybe curious about this. So um, one of the reasons why schools do this is because the easiest way for a wealthy person to hide money is to just say, I refuse to pay. And then a college can hire a team of investigators to find out if it's legit or not. So then they just establish the policy. But so many people fall through the cracks as a result of that sort of rigidity. Like you, Courtney, I, I experience this at least six times a year. Uh, um, so I was surprised that Michael, you know, you don't encounter it. May, Maybe go, my guess is it's going on behind the scenes and it doesn't quite get to you. Um, but yeah, that very but, well could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I should say, I mean, I, I see it much more from the perspective of like unwillingness because of like mistrust or misunderstanding, or I, I honestly see more of it where there's just like a lack of contact and a lack of mm -hmm. um, the student's ability to be in touch with that family member, which can look on the other side like unwillingness. Sure, sure. Yeah, I agree. I encounter that much more than you know, someone trying to be shifty and hide money. All right, Courtney, next question. My child was approved for work study. How does she actually get a work study job? And can she get a job that is related to her major? She plans on majoring in biology. Sure. So again, it depends on the school. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. almost every school I've worked at has or attended has both jobs that are deemed work study that have work study funding and jobs that are just like regular campus jobs that anyone can get. So when, some, when someone gets a work-study part of their financial aid award, you're not bound to only get work-study jobs, but sometimes there are certain perks to the jobs that have the work-study title. Um, but they'll be, you know, usually paid around the same rates. So, and uh, again, I'll, I'll say, because a lot of people don't understand, when you get a work-study job in your financial aid award, it's not money that is given up front. It's money you have to earn as you go along. Many schools will try to prioritize some way of the students on work study getting those jobs first and like making maybe students who don't have work study wait. Um, I do hear a lot of my current seniors say like, I'm not going to work right away because I just want to be adjusted to campus. And I'll usually say, well, then you probably won't get a desirable job <laughs> if you wait until <laughs> sophomore year. Um, so they might probably will be working in like dining, <laughs> which is nothing <laughs> wrong with that. Um, so, but uh, like, as the questioner asked what they want a job related to their major. Uh, so most schools 
I would say almost all of them these days have a certain type of software where they put all of their job postings that students have to sign on and check out and apply through. But it certainly doesn't hurt to do some advanced research and try to reach out to like professors or people doing what the student would want to be doing and see if there's an opening that they can, um, you know, be noticed for. Um, but they would still have to apply through that software. Um, and you can always switch a work-study job year to year. You can always get a job on campus. I already said that. That's not. So my story was I showed up to the work-study meeting my freshman year because I was like, I'm getting work-study. And they were like, no, you're not. You're not on our list. So I just went off and got a different job. Like, it, there's no big deal. And you can always get a job in the community off campus. The only mm-hmm. issue is sometimes they're not as understanding about when you can and cannot work, whereas any on-campus job, they would be more understanding. And I wanted to ask, I told Michael, I wanted to see, ask him to see how it works at Smith. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I think everything you described is, is, you know, exactly as we, as we do it, where, where we have, you know, an online, you know, way that students can see what jobs are available and, uh, and how to apply to them at reaching out to, to the professors or administrators who they would be working for and, uh, and express interest in the job, potentially share their resume, that kind of thing. And uh, we we uh, do hold back. Uh, you know, all students can get a job at Smith, and uh, as some colleges are that way. But we hold all students back for a month or so to let let uh, need based work study recipients uh, apply first, in a sense. So it, yeah, and I I mean I think I mean work study job is a great great opportunity. I mean even uh, you know for first year students who haven't been able to really make connections with faculty if initially, and uh, you know in their later years they're more likely to have a connection with a professor they had a class with or, or their area of interest to get something that may be a little more in, uh, more involved with their academic work. And yet at the same time as you know because you know as we as we kind of laugh about dining services because that's an area that hires a lot of students on campus. Now, I've certainly seen students who have had a dining service job and they keep it from one year to the next. And they, they it's it's wonderful how they'll make a connection with somebody that they, they uh, an administrator or, or somebody who works in dining that they make a connection with and, and uh, can really make it a very engaging experience. So not just the hourly wage, but, but just be a, a wonderful experience for them while they're in school. So, so yeah, so certainly something, something to, to explore for students. Good point. Good point. All right, Michael, what are some common mistakes you see students and parents make on either the FAFSA or the profile? Yeah, that's it's certainly something to be watchful for. And, I, and the, the first, it's funny when you when with this question, Mark, I, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me, I, I I go back to kind of my my roots in outdoor adventure. And uh, and I think about uh, what what some people would describe as a low probability but high consequence. And so the example I think about is like you're hiking on a really wide trail. It's very relatively flat, so pretty safe. You're not going to make a mistake or trip, most likely. But just off to the side, there's a thousand foot drop, and you you certainly don't want to fall off that drop. So so again, that's low probability that you'd make a mistake, but high consequences if you do. <laughs> so fortunately, I don't want to create panic anywhere. But the fast and the profile not quite that extreme. You're not going to drop off a thousand foot cliff or anything. But the the things that I see that again they don't you know so I'm not answering the question because they don't happen very often but but an important thing to remember is the FAFSA and the profile they are your students' documents you know even if you as the parent are really helping facilitate the process it's your students' form and so you want to be sure that it's the student's social security number you're entering, the student's name, the student's information. And, and both forms are pretty good about being very clear whose information they're asking for. And eventually, parents' information will go in there, their income information, their asset information. But you don't, you don't want to you don't want to flip-flop that information. You don't want to put, as a parent, you don't want to put your information where the student is or the reverse, and, or you don't want to double enter. It's like, oh, and every once in a while we'll see a parent, parent's income information in both the parent and the student section because they weren't paying close attention. Again, not really a common error, but it's one that, that takes a fair bit of work to untangle uh, if, if you get to that place. Also related to that, it, we don't see too often again, but but takes a lot to untangle is when parents are divorced or separated in determining who the custodial parent is, 
who should be filling out the FAFSA form, and then who would do the custodial and then separately the non-custodial uh, CSS profile. So those are those are ones to be careful of just because you want to get it right. Because again, untangling it is, is it can be a real challenge. So, so with that said, the more common things that we see where, where students and families will make a mistake, things I think about uh, are untaxed income. So that's money that's not taxed, won't show on your tax return necessarily. And the, the two big areas are what we call tax deferred. So it's money that uh, often a parent is putting into a retirement account in any given year. And so that's mm -hmm. you're, you're not paying taxes on it now. It's tax deferred. But for financial aid purposes, we'll count that as actual income. It's called untaxed mm -hmm. income. So that's that's in mm -hmm. there. The other the other untaxed piece we'll see a lot is child support that uh, that a parent receives. And uh, and, you know, most cases that's going to particularly in a college that asks for both custodial and non custodial information, the child support received by one parent should show as child support paid by the other parent. And so you typically want to see those numbers kind of line up uh, just to mm -hmm. just to keep things, you know, just just so the college really understands that detail. And now it's time for our college spotlight of the week. Friends, hopefully you heard Kevin Newton's breakdown of University College London, also known as UCL, last week. If you missed it, I highly encourage you to go back and check it out. But we will now resume the final part of Kevin's breakdown of UCL. Listen and enjoy. I have a follow-up. Okay. So there's been a trend that's been in place now for almost 20 years, maybe maybe about 16 years for elite private schools in the United States to move away from the AP. Um, this happened when I was doing boarding school admissions and college counseling. Um, we looked at Phillips Andover and Fieldston and some other schools. We liked what they did, and we moved away from it. And the reason why we moved away from it, we considered the AP to have a lot of breadth but not much depth. And so our U.S. history professor felt like I can send kids into the archives for two weeks and let them do original research, graduate level style. That's way beyond anything the AP does. I had many conversations with the head of the science department um, about how much farther you could go in biology doing, you know, customizing your own advanced classes. And then recently, you know, a lot of attention was drawn to the fact that all at once, six well-known DC, DC schools that you would probably be familiar with, having gone to William & Mary, all at once all dropped the APs simultaneously, collectively. Um, that all happened around 12 months ago. And that has not been a problem at all for U.S. schools because they have enough other information to tell, you know, the familiarity with the school and, and looking at the school profile and past track record of students and, you know, other, all the other factors that they can use to assess. But with something that's so AP centric, is somebody kind of screwed if they're coming from um, a school that has moved away from that and they've created their own advanced rigorous courses that do not sort of correspond with the sort of the standardized AP or IB curriculums? I don't think so. And here's why. The first reason if if it is this advanced course, I mean, let's let's bear in mind the APs are still in most cases introductory college courses. So if you're going above and beyond, and this is something you're serious about, certainly self-study is an option. But I think in that case, what a number of people who I've worked with in the past have chosen to do is take A-levels. And an A-level is that kind of British equivalent um, that you would take during your last two years of secondary school. And for those familiar with, say, a history AP course, they're largely DBQs, document-based questions. So it's free response questions and they go into a bit more depth like you were saying and certainly it's it's possible and it also gets towards the demonstrated interest side of things that if you're willing to take a levels then you're obviously very serious about going to the uk something that all uk and really international universities despise even though they don't have the concerns about yield protection that a lot of universities here in the us have is someone applying to them just for the prestige. The absolute worst thing you can do in an Oxford or Cambridge interview is not be prepared for why Oxford or why Cambridge. You probably won't even make it to the interview 
because Cambridge now has a supplemental quest, uh, application questionnaire that asks you, why are you interested in Cambridge? And it's not some long answer. They just want to know that you're thinking of Cambridge for something other than the fact that it's always in the top three uh, world of rankings. They just want to know that you've fallen in love with the place, even if you've never been there. Yeah, and that's very similar to here. I have to constantly ferret these comments out when I'm working with students on essays. They really allude to the, the, your ranking or your prestige or your well renowned And I'm like, you don't understand that that is like that is like chalk uh, nails on a chalkboard, right? You know, to these schools, like they don't want to feel like you're just exploiting them for their prestige. They want you to make a compelling case while you're a match, and it's very, very, very offensive. I'll never forget a uh, Brown University rep who was assigned to West Town School I worked at after an information session, you know, telling me that um, now this is go this goes back because this was. This is 2005, I believe. It was it was pre read everything electronically on paper, you know, on the computer. So you know that's a while ago, right? Right. But he said, if anybody mentions, you know, because Brown's famous for their Y Brown. If anybody mentions Ivy League, and it's funny, he had a piece of paper in his hand, he crumpled it up in a ball, and he and he pretended he was like a basketball player, he's like Doo! in the trash. Obviously, he's being a little figurative, right? But he was like, kiss, kiss of death, it's over. So there's a similarity. It sounds like. They're, they're, you know, the, the, the schools function, function the same way there. I'm curious about a ACT, SAT. Tell me what, um, their requ what their expectations are. I'm, I know they're not really test optional, so they're going to want to see those scores and what kind of numbers are they looking for? So it's a pretty wide range, actually. If you look at a place, just to step back and give some perspective, Oxford and Cambridge at the highest end are going to want – a 32 if you're looking at something that's not STEM, or a 33 if you are. And it comes out to, depending on the program, a 1450 if you're not STEM, and a 1500 if you are STEM. A little lower than that is this place like St. Andrews or UCL or Edinburgh, which is still going to be around that 29 or 1350 mark. So the better you do, the better. But at the same time, the idea um, outside of this one degree program I want to talk about at UCL that I think a lot of people would be interested in, there's no concept of general education over there. So what they're looking for is a check mark to make sure that you are a functionally literate member of society. And fairly or unfairly, they've chosen the ACT or SAT to be an indicator of that. Not every university has a firm ACT or SAT requirement, and not even every program does. A lot would rather lean into the AP program, for example, because their thought is that, frankly, if you're going to study history, you, know, you wouldn't be at this point if you didn't have basic numerical reasoning skills. So why insult your intelligence is the argument I've heard one admissions counselor who shall remain anonymous make. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't put anybody on blast publicly here. <laughs> I don't need an irate email. <laughs> but again, it's it's very much that what you'll find is it's a check mark, essentially to be checked off, just making sure you've achieved that. It helps you. It's not going to help. A 36 isn't going to help you stand out. A 1600 is not going to help you stand out if the other things in the application aren't there. And that's going to be very similar to, to over here for any highly selective school as well. I try to tell people all the time, scores can knock you out. They can't get you in. Right. But the one thing that, you know, I really think UCL has done a pretty good job with of distinguishing itself, just to, to steer back, and I, I've been the one to take us off, off topic here, is as a general rule, overseas, you stay in your field. 85 to 95 percent of your courses, if you're a biology major, are going to be biology or biochemistry or statistics, something directly related. And Europe as a whole, and especially some universities in the UK, have been taking a look at saying, we don't want to go the American liberal arts approach, but we do see a big advantage to being able to combine different fields. And what that's led to at UCL especially is the creation of an arts and sciences degree. And what they noticed was they had, they had an enormous amount of people, relatively speaking, you know, a few dozen, who they were having difficulty choosing between fields in the arts and fields in the sciences. On one hand, they wanted to know how to communicate. On the other hand, they understood the value of STEM. And 
they were losing out essentially to programs that let you combine the two more directly. There are uh, programs elsewhere in the UK where you can study under the field of um, natural sciences, you can combine the study of management with the study of physics, which obviously would have some great career options for somebody wanting to work for, you know, like a Lockheed Martin or somebody like that. So what UCL came up with was this liberal arts and sciences degree where you essentially choose a major pathway and a minor pathway. And the major pathway can be something more in the art side of things. So the, the four options are societies, cultures, engineering slash sciences, and health slash environment. And the trade-off is that if you study cultures or societies, so essentially social sciences or the humanities, you have to study as your minor either health and the environment or engineering and sciences. So you're getting a solid dose of both as well as a core of classes that show you how it all interrelates. So you may take the history of science as a class. You may take classes about the ethics of medicine and religion. And something is a, is a history and language not that I really appreciate is that they, on top of this, again, tried to create a situation where their graduates are very much prepared for the 21st century and for a global environment. So they do insist that you take a foreign language throughout. Um, one of the great ironies is that a lot of European universities, especially those that teach in English, don't require a foreign language. And UCL's and it's only the liberal arts and sciences degree is pretty unique in that it requires you to study a language all three years. Oh, that's awesome. I have two, two final questions and then let's call it a day because you know, you and I could chit chat away about UCL for literally for hours right. here, Kev. <laughs> uh, uh, go a little bit more in depth for us on the personal statement that you said is required. Tell us what that looks like. I don't know if you remember what the U S personal statement is like for the common application or not, but it's a you know 650 word max essay with seven prompts, and it's very much <clears throat> you explaining um, why something is reflecting on 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 something that shows an area of personal growth, and then explaining you know how you've grown and why you've grown through whatever topic and what you've learned through whatever you share. So it's very reflective. It's not something like focused on you know um, take like do a deep dive on robotics or something like that. So that's the first question. And then the second one is you, if you could just touch on costs. Sure. So the general rule among personal statements overseas is that they are very much almost like a why. But instead of having each university request a personal statement, at least in the UK, you get one for the five programs you get to apply to. So you have to be focused on a bit about your history, but also why you want to study this field. So, for example, someone interested in international relations might talk about her involvement in the Model UN before. And they, this is unique because it's the one time that extracurriculars even have a blip on the radar is in the personal statement just to prove your past interest. Now, if you don't have those extracurriculars, it's fine. You write about why it's interesting to you. And, you know, something you, you alluded to earlier was the Why Brown essay. You don't necessarily, with the exception of Cambridge and a handful of others who are going to ask for a supplement, and that's increasingly rare. You don't get into why one specific university, because every other university you're applying to is reading this personal statement. So if you go into why UCL, you're going to have a problem. Now, there is some flexibility. If, you know, you've, if you're writing about, say, studying medicine versus a program in biomedical sciences, you can address the biomedical sciences in part of it and the medicine in the other. And it's a, it's a sort of agreement among universities that they'll, like, they're not going to hold the part of it that you talk about that other field against you. And it doesn't even have to be closely related fields. A few years ago, I was working with someone who was interested in either biomedical sciences or international relations. And she talked about both. And the universities just simply when it was a, a program that she wasn't applying to at their university, they understood the, the constraints of that. That's a fourth on the pragmatic side of things. It's 4,000 characters and you copy and paste it directly into the UCAS application outside of Cambridge and a very small handful of others. There's no supplement. So this isn't the common app where you write the one common app personal statement and then write 
shorter supplements for a number of other universities. It's simply something that's not done. Now, as for the cost, first of all, the application cost and for UCAS, and I just always get a smile reminding people of this because it's kind of the, the good news before the other shoe drops, is about $32 for up to five applications. Now, when it gets to the actual cost of the overseas degree, if you look at something like arts and sciences at, at UCL, it's 26,600 pounds per year in tuition. And you factor in probably around another 12 or 13,000 pounds per year in living expenses and travel. All right, Kev, you got to get it, man. We're not over there. Give us dollars, man. All right. Well, let me pull up the calculator here. So we'll call it 40,000 a year. And at last time I checked, the pound was trading at about $1.35. So you're looking at 54 grand a year. That's a three-year degree. So you're looking at, uh, it's $162,000, give or take. Now, obviously that's more than a typical state school. It is comparable to some state schools. However, you know, if you're, um, as you said, I went to William & Mary, so I, co- I constantly feel that I can make fun of them. Sure. You know, it's- <laughs> They're very high. It's quite <laughs> comparable to an in-state student at William & Mary. So if you're sitting in Fairfax County, Virginia, and you know, not going to get that cost of living adjustment, it's practical. Well, that th- three year versus four years is also huge right. too, right? I mean, it's not only the substantial savings, but it's the opportunity cost of of you either working for that year and what you would make, and so that's a it could be a hundred thousand dollars swing, forty thousand you don't you don't pay, and then sixty thousand you make. Right, you know, it's that's the kind of thing that I I find hard to quantify. So I'm glad you did it instead of me. <laughs> um, and that's the that's the real thing is that there. The cost differentials, you know, UCL living in central London is going to be a more expensive option. Um, The only options that are really more than that are if you were to study something like physics at UCL, which you could tack on another $20,000 or so over the course of the degree, simply because science is more expensive to study in the UK. Or if you were studying something at Cambridge or Oxford, because you have at Cambridge, you have college fees, which add a substantial amount at Oxford, you've got um, just higher tuition. But again, that said, it's as for financial aid, there are some universities, UCL sadly is not one of them that do offer some merit based and need based aid. UCL kind of takes the opinion that if you're an American, you've got a number of opportunities here in the U.S. and they would rather reserve their need-based money for someone from a developing country. But students could still get the federal direct student loan if they Absolutely. wanted that. Uh, you know, th- those do work overseas. 20, 27 grand over four years if, and to help a little bit. Right. It's Can they work? Can a student work over there? Are they able to get work visas and work or not? That is a great question. And the best advice I can give is be very polite to the person processing your visa when you cross over. So it's really left up to their discretion. Typically, you can work a certain number of hours per week during term time. I think it's it depends on what kind of visa they give. It's between 10 and 20. Um, outside of term time, you can work up to 40. And it's a great way to supplement. It's not going to, in the UK at least, it's never going to be a huge amount of money that really, because they're going to insist on seeing your bank records when they process your student visa and make sure that you can pay for it. Other countries, and we can talk about this at a later time, are a little bit more lenient about that. They also tend to have much lower tuition rates. But certainly, you know, because it is up to the discretion of the person as you're crossing into the country, be nice, remember your manners. And in most, the vast majority of cases, only if you're a real jerk will they limit your right to work if you've got a student visa. So it's always nice to, even after that eight or 12 hour flight, to have a smile and be pleasant. Awesome. This has been fantastic, Kevin. And I love it every time you come on. I'm already excited about the next one. And I can't wait to talk with you about what school we're going to do next, because I know that there's a huge need out there to understand these international schools and and who better than you. And so this has been absolutely awesome. But I'm promising you something. Third time is the charm. We've never had somebody be interviewed on a podcast that hasn't gone on the hot seat. And I don't know how it happened, but you got out of it the first time, and now this is a college spotlight. So I'm just telling you right now, get ready to squirm because I'm coming after you with some challenging questions, but it, it's all good. It's all good. That's all right. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I may have to throw myself an easy one. 
There you go. Yeah, if you could, you know, just let our listeners remind our listeners how they could um, contact you if they maybe want to. Um, I think you still do the thirty-minute complimentary consultation for anyone who might want to explore your services. Um, if anyone is is interested in that, can you want to explain how they could reach you? Sure. My website is www.aneducationabroad.com. Um, you can email me directly at Kevin at aneducationabroad.com and I think if you know if you're driving somewhere and it's a little too much to write down, I believe I'm listed on Mark's website as well. So, you know, always happy to find out if this is a good fit for somebody. Awesome, thank you so much, Kevin. I really, really appreciate it. And um, you know, you know, you and I will be talking, so we'll be in touch, my friend. All right, take care, Mark. Always a pleasure. Next week in the news is college worth it? Usually, but not always. Article from the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy blog by Andrew Clark. Our questions from our listeners are, number one, how can you evaluate whether a school does better than its peers at looking after your first-year students? That's from Dave. And then question number two, I attend a small school and two of my peers committed to Duke as athletic recruits. Will Duke consider taking three students from my school small school, or is their commitment going to hurt my chances? Our interview is part five of five, the final part, with Michael Ireland, the Assistant Director of Financial Aid of Smith College, and Courtney Hatch Blavelt, a former financial aid officer at four colleges and Director of College Counseling at the Miss Hall School, answering 12 questions our listeners sent in about financial aid and paying for college. See you next week, Dave. See ya. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listing app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. We have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. David Williams and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer who fixes all of our many errors is Nemanja Modfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Boss. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianas Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at yourcollegemonkid.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week.